Hey there, welcome back to another season of Novel Conversations. Before we start the show, I wanted to recommend another great podcast about books. It's the Professional Book Nerds Podcast. If you enjoy listening to Novel Conversations, I think you'll really enjoy this podcast as well. The Professional Book Nerds Podcast offers up book recommendations and interviews your favorite authors every Monday and Thursday. Both Jill Grunenwald and Adam Sokol have spent their careers in the book world and have an inside look on exciting books you're going to love. In addition to their twice-a-week episodes, each month they preview the best new books coming out. They're not just book nerds, they're professional book nerds. Visit professionalbooknerds.com, subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts, or check them out on our own network, evergreenpodcasts.com. All right, up next, Novel Conversations. Welcome. I'm Frank Lavallo, and this is Novel Conversations, a podcast about the world's greatest stories. Each week on Novel Conversations, I talk to two guests about one book, and together we summarize the story for you. We introduce you to the characters, we tell you what happens to them, and we read from the book along the way. So if you love hearing a good story, you're in the right place. Today I'm going to have a conversation about the novel The Red Pony by John Steinbeck. And I'll be joined in my conversation by our Novel Conversations readers, Elizabeth Flood and Phil Setnick. Elizabeth, Phil, hello. Hi, Frank. Hello. Guys, before we get started, let me read you a quick introduction to our novel, The Red Pony. Published in 1945, about six years or so after his masterpiece, The Grapes of Wrath, John Steinbeck's novella, The Red Pony, is the story, well, actually four stories, about the young boy, Jody Tiflin. The four roughly chronological chapters of The Red Pony tell us four different stories about young Jody and his life on the ranch of his father, Carl Tiflin. By showing us how Jody interacts and learns from his father, from ranch hand Billy Buck, and even from some of the ranch animals, Steinbeck allows us to learn and grow with Jody. In each chapter, we learn the lesson that Jody learns. We sense his impatience, we even see his cruelty, and we see his growth. With that quick introduction, Phil, let me ask you, did you enjoy reading this book? Very much so. It took me back to my childhood, reading Jody Tiflin goofing off from time to time, wandering around chasing things, throwing rocks at things, cutting things up. I very much enjoyed when he left a lunchbox full of various lizards for his mother to find as she did the dishes. Yeah, filling your lunchbox full of lizards. That's a typical boyhood prank. Precisely. Okay, Elizabeth, as I said in our opening segment, this is really the story, or four stories, of Jody Tiflin. But as our novel opens up on the Tiflin Ranch in the Salinas Valley of California, the first character we actually meet is the ranch hand, Billy Buck. Tell me a little bit about Billy Buck from our first chapter, The Gift. Well, Steinbeck describes Billy as a broad, bandy-legged man with a walrus mustache. He has very strong, muscular hands, and he wakes up every morning the same way. He brushes down the horses, he sets the brushes down almost in the exact same place every morning, and he goes up to the house for breakfast and sits down on the steps because he is just a cow hand, and it would be unfitting for him to go in before the rest of the family. And then, Phil, we quickly meet our young boy, Jody Tiflin. That's right. While Billy Buck is waiting for someone in the family to enter the house so that he can then enter, Jody hears the triangle. It wakes him up out of bed. And not as strictly habitual as Billy Buck's morning routine, he makes his way fairly quickly to the breakfast table. And, Phil, it's at this point we meet Jody's father, Carl Tiflin. And Steinbeck really hands us a lot of information in just one quick sentence. And I quote, Jody's tall, stern father came in then, and Jody knew from the noise on the floor that he was wearing boots, but he looked under the table anyway, just to make sure. Yeah, just like a kid. He hears the noise, he knows what it is, just has to look and make sure all the same. It seems that Steinbeck makes a point about mentioning what shoes the characters are wearing, whether it's work boots or around-the-house shoes. And this time, Jody sees that his father is wearing work boots, so he knows he's going to work. And Phil, in the next paragraph, we learn even more about Carl and a little bit more about his relationship with his son, Jody. That's right. Steinbeck wrote, quote, His father was a stern disciplinarian. Jody obeyed him in everything without questions of any kind. Well, Carl Tiflin and the ranch hand, Billy Buck, they're off to do some work today. Yes, they were off to Salinas to sell some old cows to the butcher. And actually, Billy Buck, the ranch hand, thinks he can do this alone, but Carl Tiflin wants to come along. Mr. Tiflin likes to have a hand in everything that's going on at the ranch. But more than that, in this instance, there's going to be an excellent opportunity, once the cows are sold, to visit the bar. 
Ah, so is that why Carl's going along? Or is he going along to keep Billy Buck out of the bar? Well, Carl specifically says, besides, your throat gets pretty dry. That's right, he does. But Phil, there's another opportunity here. With Carl and Billy Buck gone from the ranch, Jody has a lot of free time on his hands, and he goes off wandering. He does. And yet, Steinbeck writes that he feels, quote, an uncertainty in the air, a feeling of change and of loss, and of the gain of new and unfamiliar things, end quote. And over the hillside, there were two black buzzards, and Jody hates the buzzards as he says, quote, all decent things hate them, but they couldn't be hurt because they make away with the carrion, end quote. That's right. They help keep the land clear of dead carcasses. So this is kind of the foreboding of what is to come. Steinbeck is the king of foreshadowing. But Phil, Jody can't wander around the ranch for too long. Yeah. After a few morning chores, throwing rocks at a few dogs, he has to get on to school. And he does head off to school, but with a pocket full of rocks, just in case there's some more animals he can throw them at. You have to be prepared. Typical 10-year-old boy, right? That's right. <laughs> And then as a typical 10-year-old boy, when he comes home from school, he's got to do his chores again. But then after his chores are done, he's got some free time and off to the woods he goes. And he goes wandering to the woods with a rifle. Yeah, he takes his rifle, but it has no cartridges in it. What? No cartridges? His father said he has to be 12 before he can have cartridges. So for two years, you can picture Jody wandering around the ranch in the woods, carrying an unloaded gun just to point it at things. And Steinbeck writes that, quote, nearly all of his father's presents were given with reservations, which hampered their value somewhat, but it was good discipline, end quote. I think that quote sums up the whole novel, in a way. It certainly sums up Carl Tiflin's personality. And his relationship with his son. Absolutely. And he's actually about to give his son another gift, the gift of our chapter heading, but this gift also comes with reservations. Yes, as the title says, it's a red pony. Ah, the red pony. Which Jody will name Gabalan. Named after the nearby Gabalan Mountains. Well, when he saw this glorious animal, he thought, how can I name him? So he tried to think of the most beautiful thing he could think of, and those were the mountains that he always sees. And Phil, what are the reservations that this beautiful red present comes with? It so happens that this red pony is not even halter broken yet, so you can't even put a bridle and a lead rope on him to walk him around the ranch. Essentially, it's a young colt. It's a colt with zero training whatsoever. So that's the job that needs to be done. To make the pony useful, he has to be trained and broken. Well, even though we said Carl Tiflin was a stern disciplinarian and seemed to be a bit of a hard father, this is some gift and some responsibility to put on a 10-year-old boy. Absolutely. And even more so, because as Jody goes to school and tells his friends about this, it appears that he's the only kid in school with a horse of his very own at this young age. He becomes a bit of a celebrity and almost sells tickets to see the horse after school. Steinbeck also writes on a similar note describing the other boys at school, quote, Out of a thousand centuries, they drew the ancient admiration of the footmen for the horsemen. You know, Phil, I forgot that quote. That's a good one. Well, Elizabeth, Phil, how does Jody take up his new responsibilities? Like a champ. Steinbeck says that, quote, Jody never waited for the triangle to get him out of bed after the coming of the pony, end quote. He was so eager to get out there and comb and brush and take care of this pony that he was even willing to forego sleep. It's really one of the first steps that Jody makes towards growing up. He has now developed his own routine. So just as the book started with Billy Buck's routine, now Jody has a strict routine. And he needs no one to remind him to follow it. But, Phil, there are a couple times where his mom has to gently remind him that there are other chores he needs to do around the ranch. He has to stock the wood box. He has to gather eggs. It's not just all about taking care of his new red pony. Right. And he also starts to notice all the nuances of this horse. He's starting to be more observant, and he sees how the horse looks as well as how it communicates with its body. It talks with its ears, and you can tell what kind of mood the horse is in by the position of the ears. And the pony's a bit of a bad pony. Steinbeck writes, but in many ways, he was a bad pony. He bit Jody in the pants and stomped on Jody's feet. Now and then, his ears went back, and he aimed a tremendous kick at the boy. Well, Elizabeth, taking care of a horse is one thing, but for Jody to start training this horse, he's going to have to be taught some things himself. Who's doing the training of Jody? Well, Billy Buck is renowned as a horse trainer and breaker in these parts. He's been teaching Jody how to break the pony. This is where Jody's getting his first compliments from adults because he seems to be taking to the training very, very well. Billy explains that, quote, we could force break the horse into doing everything, but he wouldn't be as good a horse if we did, end quote. And through Billy's guidance, Jody is becoming quite the trainer himself. And this is something for a 10-year-old boy to receiving compliments from an adult. We're pretty sure he's not getting a whole lot of compliments from his dad. 
Right. He gets a great deal of pride swelling up in him when he does get any compliments. And bit by bit, his father and mother are growing in pride for their son as they see how good a job he's doing and how well he listens. And Billy Buck makes sure to tell Carl Tiflin how good a job his son is doing so that the father knows Jody's coming along and fulfilling all his responsibilities. Jody becomes very fond of Billy because he has such confidence in him. But that confidence is soon shaken. Well, Phil, now that sounds a bit ominous. I think you better explain. Well, from where Elizabeth last read, the very next page, Jody takes Billy's advice and leaves the colt in a corral all day when he goes to school. And it so happens that Billy Buck did not think it would rain. Even though it was getting to be towards Thanksgiving, nearing winter, it should be safe. It shouldn't rain. And he took that advice, leaves the colt in the corral, he goes to school, and when he comes home, the colt is in the corral in the rain, quite frigid. And this sets up the first conflict between Jody and Billy Buck. Jody says, how could you do this? You promised you'd take care of my horse. You left him out in the rain. All day. He had assured him that a little rain never hurt anything. Well, does a little bit of rain, and actually in this case a lot of rain, hurt the red pony? It sure does. Mm. When Jody gets home, he tries to dry the pony with some sex, but it doesn't seem to warm the pony up enough. He's still shaking and shivering. And every step of the way, Billy Buck keeps reassuring him, I've seen much worse, he'll be fine, nothing to worry about. But unfortunately, Jody hears the sound that he's dreading, a hollow, rasping cough. Right, and according to Billy Buck, he's got the strangles. But Phil, Billy Buck thinks he's got a couple solutions for this. He does. The first solution is a concoction of hops, carbolic acid, some grains, and boiling hot water to steam the congestion out of the horse's sinuses. He mixes all that up into a feed bag and puts it over the pony's head. It seems to work very well at first, but then the second dose doesn't seem to work quite as well. And then a growth in his throat seems to get larger and worse. Billy Buck has to then lance that and drain some disgusting fluid. Yeah, a very unpleasant scene. And that also does not seem to help. Elizabeth, you mentioned an unpleasant scene, but Jody's right there with Billy Buck. He hasn't run away. He hasn't run crying to his mother. He's taking this as a man, trying to save his horse with Billy Buck. He has grown to love this horse as if it were a brother or a child almost. If there's going to be something done to this horse, he wants to be there to take care of him and to help in any way he can. Okay, Phil, what's his next solution? At this point, he's still having difficulty breathing, and Billy Buck has to give the horse a tracheotomy. Does that work? Not so much. It helps him breathe better for a short period of time, but he very quickly is defeated. Elizabeth, Jody's going to lose his red pony, isn't he? He certainly is, but the pony's not going to take it lying down. Jody spends the night with the horse, and he awakens, and the horse is not there, and he realizes that he has gone out. It's so early in the morning that the dew is still there, and he can follow the horse's tracks. But Phil, he doesn't have to follow the tracks to find his horse. There's another sign. No, he quickly sees buzzards circling just a short distance away, and he realizes that they're following his pony. And Elizabeth, it seems that with the buzzards, one of Steinbeck's foreshadowings is about to come true. It's the culmination of Jody's fear of the buzzards. As he approaches the horse, there are buzzards circling, and there's one on top of him. And by the time he gets there, it's too late. The buzzard has plunged its beak into the eye of the horse, and the pony is now dead. Quote, the first buzzard sat on the pony's head, and his beak had just risen, dripping with dark eye fluid. Jody doesn't react well when he sees the buzzards attacking his pony. Not in the least. He charges headlong into these buzzards. He catches the one that has just jabbed its beak into his pony, and he's hanging on, and the buzzard's grabbing back with its claws, and then the buzzard tries to fight back. Another horrible scene. The quote is like this. As the buzzard hopped along to take off, Jody caught its wingtip and pulled it down. It was nearly as big as he was. The free wing crashed into his face with the force of a club, but he hung on. The claws fastened on his leg, and the wing elbows battered his head on either side. Jody groped blindly with his free hand. His fingers found the neck of the struggling bird. The red eyes looked into his face, calm and fearless and fierce. The naked head turned from side to side. Then the beak opened and vomited a stream of putrefied fluid. Ew. Jody brought up his knee and fell on the great bird. He held the neck to the ground with one hand while his other found a piece of sharp white quartz. The first blow broke the beak sideways, and black blood spurted from the twisted, leathery mouth corners. Oh, man. He struck again and missed. The red, fearless eyes still looked at him, impersonal and afraid and detached. He struck again and again until the buzzard lay dead, until its head was a red pulp. He was still beating the dead bird when Billy Buck pulled him off 
and held him tightly to calm his shaking. And Elizabeth, here's where Jody's dad and Billy Buck both step in. His father reacts by saying, well, Jody, the buzzer didn't kill the pony. Don't you know that? But Billy Buck realizes it's much more than that. And in fact, Billy Buck lashes out at Carl Tiflin. I'm also convinced that mixed in with Billy Buck's reaction here is his own guilt that he was wrong and that he, as Steinbeck wrote, was fallible. And really, isn't that the lesson that Jody learns in this first chapter? That adults can make mistakes, even someone as idolized as Billy Buck. Who is the best of the best. All right, with the ending of our first chapter of the novel, The Red Pony, let's take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll move into the second chapter, The Great Mountains. But I'd like to take a little time now to talk about our sponsor for this season of Novel Conversations, Literati, the leading kids' book club in America. You know, with libraries, schools, and bookstores shut down, How are you going to keep your kids learning and growing? Well, I suggest Books from Literati, the number one book club for kids. I think that's the best place to start. Literati is a subscription book club that makes it easy to find unique and interesting books for your kids by delivering great stories straight to your doorstep. And Literati knows that home deliveries will be critical in meeting your need for uplifting educational materials in the coming weeks and months. Reading books together will help create a time of adventure and bonding for your family. And it has real educational benefits. Kids who read books have better vocabularies and longer attention spans. And I want to make sure you understand, I've seen these books. These are not used books or old titles. These are new books, current titles. And not just fiction, but also nonfiction. I received a box from Literati, and that box had a novel, a science title, and a book of puzzles. So with so many kids out of school right now, Literati is working to get books into the hands of families who don't have libraries and educational materials of their own. And as fans of Novel Conversations, right now we're going to give our listeners a special limited time offer. Right now, for a limited time, go to literati.com slash novel for 25% off your first two orders. Let me repeat that. This is their best offer available anywhere. But to get it, you have to go to literati.com slash novel. 25% off your first two orders. Literati.com slash novel. Now, let's get back to our discussion about the novel, The Red Pony by John Steinbeck. All right, Elizabeth, Phil, now let's move into the second chapter of our four-chapter novel. This chapter's called The Great Mountains. How does this chapter start, Phil? Well, it shows Jody as a bored boy with a slingshot. A slingshot with store-bought rubber bands. That's right. It has power. And what's this bored boy with a powerful slingshot going to do on this ranch full of animals? He goes and kills a bird and pretty much... Mutilates. ...rips its wings off and tears its entrails out and then hides the evidence. But why does he hide the evidence? He feels shame about what adults might say if they saw what he had done to this little thrush. But guys, he doesn't stop at the birds. He's got a neat little trick for his dog, Double Tree Mutt. He sets a rat trap where he knew the dog would walk. Yeah, and he baits it with the cheese that he knows his dog will go for. it. That's awful. I know, it's awful, but sure enough... Sure enough, it gets the dog and he limps away. He limps away? I thought the trap got him on the nose. Well, when the dog was younger, his leg got caught in a coyote trap. And from then on, no matter where he was hurt, he would always limp. But Phil, he quickly tires of these boyish pursuits and he starts to ponder deeper, bigger questions like, where did those mountains come from and what's up there? Yeah, he kind of starts to get this wanderlust, creative explorer sort of spirit and starts asking everyone, what's in those mountains back there? Have you ever been there? And what do the adults tell him? Jody's father tells him that there's nothing in the mountains themselves, and on the other side, there's nothing but the ocean. Nothing but dirt and rocks and dead grass. And then he asks his mom, hey mom, do you know what's going on in the mountains? And his mom says, only the bear. What bear? Why, the one that went over the mountain to see what he could see. Of course, I forgot about the bear. And that's all the information Jody ever gets, isn't it? Yes, which I don't think satiates him. Actually, the quote is, that was all the information Jody ever got and it made the mountains dear to him, end quote. It was really, I think, just the mystery of the unknown that captivated his imagination. Well, speaking of unknowns capturing his imagination, we're about to get a huge unknown, and it really captures his imagination. An old Hispanic paisano walks onto the ranch. Yep. His name is Hitano, and he says, I have come back. Come back? Come back from where, Jody wants to know. Doesn't everyone. Well, then tell me the story of Hitano. Well, basically, Hitano says that he was born on this land and that he wants to die there. I'm guessing this is going to go over really well with Carl Tiflin. It doesn't sound like a very disciplined approach to managing a ranch. Hi, I'm Emma. And I'm Joe. And And we're we're the Professional professional Book Book Nerds. Nerds. 
Two Mondays a month, we interview authors and talk about their upcoming books, what drives them, and their go-to order at the cafe. On Thursdays, we share recommendations and dive into topics readers face, like how do I actually read the books on my to-be-read list? You can find the Professional Book Nerds podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Want to learn more about us? Our website is professionalbooknerds.com, and you can find us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at ProBookNerds. We hope you'll come and listen, and as always, happy happy reading. reading! It doesn't go over well at all with Carl Tiflin. He's polite enough to tell him, quote, you can stay for dinner, sleep in the bunkhouse for the night, stay for breakfast, and then you need to get on to your own family. Jody's confused by this because he thinks his father has an old horse that he loves, and his father's letting this old horse live on his land, and he quickly draws the comparison to this old horse, which is as useless as Hitano. And he thinks, if my dad's letting this horse remain here, why not Hitano too? And Phil, when Jody calls his father on this comparison, the old man thinks, hmm, you've actually got a point there. Yes, but Carl says, quote, If eggs and ham grew on the side of the hill like grass does, we could turn him out and let him graze too, and it wouldn't be such a big deal. But Carl goes further and crueler. That's right. He says, maybe I ought to just put the horse out of his misery and put a bullet in him, and then he'll no longer be a nuisance, end quote and very bluntly draws a comparison between the old horse and the Gitano in front of Gitano. So just as in the last chapter, Jody learned an important lesson about adults like Billy Buck, in this chapter he's learning an important lesson about adults like his father. Even his father can make mistakes. Steinbeck went on to write, Jody knew how his father was probing for a place to hurt in Gitano. He had been probed often. His father knew every place in the boy where a word would fester. Yeah, but Phil, this time I think the words didn't fester with Jody. The words actually festered with Hitano. By the next morning, Hitano's gone, and he's taken the old horse with him. Right. And Billy actually asks Carl, do you want to go after him? And Carl says, well, no, it's just saving me from burying the horse. Well, what does happen to Hitano and the old horse in the mountains? We're left to draw our own conclusions. But the last thing we see is Hitano going over the hill on the old horse with something shiny. And Elizabeth, everyone thinks that something shiny was a gun. But we know it wasn't a gun because there's no gun missing. And Jody, when he had gone to talk to Hitano about the mountains the night before, he saw that Hitano had a rapier, which is a slender sword. Yeah, perhaps a family heirloom. From back in the old rancho days, as he said. So, Phil, as you said, we're left to draw our own conclusions. And what conclusions do we draw? The same that Carl Tiflin drew, that they were going over that hill to die. And that's how our chapter two, The Great Mountains, ends. With one last parting thought from Jody that Steinbeck writes, he was full of a nameless sorrow. Now we begin our third chapter, our third story, and this one's titled The Promise. Get me started on this chapter, Phil. Once again, Jody Tiflin is wandering around being a boy. He's collecting horned toads and other types of lizards and insects and bugs and filling his lunch pail with them. Well, at least this time he's not killing them. Right, just collecting them. He's not sure what he's going to do with them. When he gets to the house, his mother says, quote, Your father wants you. And he forgets all about the things in his lunchbox and leaves them on the counter for his mother to clean. Yikes. Literally. Exactly. Well, Phil, while Jody's mom is yelling in the kitchen, what's his father have to say to him? His father says that, quote, Billy Buck says that you did a marvelous job raising that colt until he died. And if he had the chance to have another horse, would you be willing to work for the price of it? And of course, Jody says immediately, yes, sir. I'd love to. Happy to. Whatever you say. And Elizabeth, in fact, that's what's going to happen. Jody's going to get another horse, but this time a newborn colt. Right. There's a man over the ridge that has a stallion, and they're going to take Nellie, their mare, to the stallion, who's used in those parts for studying. But it'll cost $5, and Jody will have to work all summer to pay off those $5. But that's a bargain he's absolutely willing to make. Absolutely. And so, does Nellie get studded? Yes. She sure does. But Billy Buck tells Jody that it'll be almost a year before the colt will be born. Billy Buck tells that to Jody, and Jody on some level understands that, but he's still harboring some doubts about Billy Buck, and so he continues to question, are you sure she's all right? Are you sure she's okay? And Billy starts to be wary of that. He doesn't want to make too many promises in case something goes wrong. They both learned a lesson in that first chapter. Yes. But what Billy really learns is that he does not want to disappoint Jody again. And Jody finally wears him down, and Billy promises to get him a good cult. Well, Phil, does Billy keep that promise to Jody? Yes, but it is not pretty. Uh Uh-oh. Elizabeth, what's happening? 
Well, when Nellie goes into labor, Billy realizes something's wrong. In fact, it's a breech birth and the cult is completely turned around. And it's too far turned around for Billy to pull him out. Which would have been option one. Right. Phil, what's option two? Option two is you have to decide whether you're going to save the mayor or the cult. And what option do they take? The combination of Billy feeling that he promised a cult and guilt about the last cult having died, he decides he's going to save the cult. Elizabeth, how does he save the cult? Well, first Billy tells Jody to leave, and when Jody refuses to leave, he says, fine, but you must turn your head. And with Jody's eyes averted, Billy has to club the mare to death and then literally cut the colt from the mare. And essentially, he turns to Jody and says, here's the colt I promised you. Yeah. It's a very dramatic way to end the chapter called The Promise. I almost envision Billy just almost storming out of the barn and throwing the colt into Jody's hands. He does. And the quote is, there is the colt I promised. And that's how our third chapter, The Promise, ends. Correct. Mm -hmm. And now, Elizabeth, our final chapter, our final story about Jody, and this one's called... The Leader of the People. The Leader of the People. Well, Elizabeth, who's the Leader of the People? Jody's maternal grandfather. Well, Phil, how does our final chapter, The Leader of the People, begin? Not unlike the previous three. Uh Uh-oh, is Jody chasing animals again? Getting ready to chase animals. Hmm. He's coveting his opportunity to eradicate the mice, which are in the last few inches of the winter's hay. Right, these hay mounds have been on the ranch now since the end of summer, and the mice have been very comfortable living there. And he says, quote, They've been getting fat and living without fear. But now? That time is done. And Jody sighs with satisfaction because the mice were doomed. Yeah, but before he can get to the mice chasing and the mice killing... He sees his father coming with something white in his hand, and he knows it must be a letter. A letter? So he runs to the house and tells his mother a letter has come. And this scene is funny. Instead of his mother saying, oh, really, a letter? I wonder who it's from. His mother gives Jody a hard time for being a gossip and running into the house to tell ahead of time there's a letter coming. She calls him Big Britches. That's right. And when Carl's told about it, he says, yep, Jody's got his big britches in everybody's business. What business is it of yours, son, that we've got a letter? But anyway, let's get to the letter. Who's this letter from? Grandpa. And he's on his way that very day. Oh, cool. Grandpa's coming to town. But Phil, why is Grandpa coming to town? He's really just coming to visit. But one thing that always comes with Grandpa are his old stories. Stories about Indians and crossing the plains. Stories which have been told many, many, many times before. But Phil, these are stories that Jody loves to hear. Absolutely. But Carl is fed up with them. And Elizabeth, Carl certainly makes his opinion well known to his wife. Right. And she doesn't like hearing it from Carl. You know, we get the impression they've had this discussion before about Grandpa's visit and his tales. I think it's a sore spot in their marriage. But Phil, since we've never heard Grandpa's tales, and Jody certainly wants to hear them again, why don't you tell us what Grandpa's story is? Well, Grandpa came out to California from the east, crossed the plains with a wagon team, and he was the leader of the people. He led the wagon train, fighting off Indians along the way, and he's never really done anything else that he thinks is worth talking about ever since. Clearly that wagon trip was the highlight of his life, but his disappointment was that he hit the ocean and it just ended. The land stopped. There's nowhere else for him to lead people. Grandpa clearly tells Jody, quote, it wasn't getting here that mattered. It was movement and westering. And Grandpa somewhat despairs of today's generation and the fact that they have none of these journeys left to take. In fact, he thinks the younger men are getting soft. Now there's no longer some western land to travel to. Men are settling down. He basically feels you can't grow up hard without hardship. That's right. Now they have their stable, functioning farms in place. Right. He says that going west isn't a hunger anymore for the new generations, like it was for them. And for them, it was not about the destination. It was about the journey, the westering, as Grandpa called it. Right. He says that they, quote, carried their life out there and set it down the way ants carry eggs, end quote. And he was the leader, and that's what made him proud. All of this really sinks in with Jody, and Jody reflects while Grandfather's there, quote, He wished he could have been living in the heroic time, but he knew he was not of heroic timber. A race of giants had lived then, fearless men, men of a staunchness unknown in this day. And how is Carl taking these latest rounds of endless stories? Well, Carl, whenever Grandfather's out of the room, complains. And his complaints are getting more and more brutal until at last at breakfast. Downright mean. Carl really unleashes on his father-in-law. And it happens that his father-in-law is in the other room and hears all of this. And Jody is well aware of this attitude of his father, as well as the shame that his grandfather now feels. It was a really hard scene to swallow when Grandfather is talking to Jody about his view of the Westering now. 
He confesses to Jody, saying, quote, I shouldn't stay here feeling the way I do. I feel as though the crossing wasn't worth doing. Well, Elizabeth, it's got to be pretty powerful for Jody to hear this go on between his father and his grandfather. What does he learn from this? Well, in this very last scene of the novel, I think that Jody learns to be selfless. Yeah. As grandfather is sitting on the steps rather disconsolate, Steinbeck wrote, quote, Jody ran into the kitchen where his mother was wiping the last of the breakfast dishes. Can I have a lemon to make a lemonade for grandfather? His mother mimicked, and another lemon to make a lemonade for you? No, ma'am, I don't want one. And what is this last exchange showing us? He's no longer thinking of himself. He's thinking of others. Right. Normally, he might have run into his mom and said, hey, can I have a lemon to make grandpa lemonade and maybe an extra lemon to make myself some lemonade? It's a big jump for a young person to go from the egocentric mentality to an other-centered mentality. And essentially, that's how our fourth chapter and our novel ends. We've really now seen some changes in Jody Tiflin. Even though these stories are in a short amount of chronological time, the boy really does grow up. There's a lot of things that help him along that path. Now, of course, we haven't had time to go through all the lessons that Jody learned or all the stories about some of our other characters. So now, if you have a moment you want to share or a quote you want to read, here's your opportunity. Phil? I enjoyed when Jody ran out to meet his grandfather. He knew he was coming, so he ran out to wait for him. And he arrives, and one of the first things Jody suggests is, quote, Why don't you come with me to kill all the mice that are hiding in the bottom of the haystack? Jody's grandfather says, Mouse hunt, Jody? Have the people of this generation come down to hunting mice? They aren't very strong, the new people, but I hardly thought mice would be game for them. And Jody responds, No, sir, it's just play. And two paragraphs down below, a far more profound comparison, a really sad and tragic comparison is made. Jody explained, quote, It wouldn't be much like hunting Indians, I guess. And Grandpa responds, No, not much. But then later, when the troops were hunting Indians and burning teepees, it wasn't much different from your mouse hunt. There was a lot of wisdom in that old man. There was. Elizabeth, do you have something to share? I have a great example of Steinbeck's use of imagery. There's an overflowing water tub. Steinbeck describes a patch of perpetually green grass that always grows there. And Jody goes to that patch of grass when he needs consolation or refuge. That spot on the ranch is very dear to him. In contrast, Steinbeck writes about another place on the ranch where a big black cypress tree grows. Jody is fascinated by this place, but it frightens him as well, because it's where the pigs get slaughtered and hung. Steinbeck writes that the black cypress tree by the bunkhouse was, quote, as repulsive to Jody as the water tub was dear to him, end quote. And Steinbeck exemplifies this when Jody is walking and thinking of Nellie and her colt. He writes, Suddenly he saw that he was under the black cypress, and it seemed to him an unlucky thing. And it turns out it was unlucky. It sure was. I just want to read a quick line here that I enjoyed and seemed very familiar to me. It's when Jody's given a compliment by Billy Buck and how that compliment makes Jody feel. I think as kids, we can all relate to getting a compliment from an adult. And the quote is, it made Jody feel warm and proud. So proud that when he went back to the house, he bowed his legs and swayed his shoulders, just as horsemen do. Hmm. I still act like that. <laughs> <laughs> I think on that humble line, we'll end our conversation today about the novel, The Red Pony by John Steinbeck. Phil, Elizabeth, I want to thank you both for coming in and having this conversation with me. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Thank you both very much. You've been listening to Novel Conversations. Novel Conversations is a production of Evergreen Podcasts, formerly the Front Porch People. If you'd like to hear more Novel Conversations, you can go to our new network at evergreenpodcast.com or listen on iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. And if you like the podcast, don't forget to leave us a review. It really helps. Novel Conversations was produced by Julie Fink and engineered by Sean Rule Hoffman. A special thanks to our executive producer, Joan Andrews, and our researchers, Scott and L.D. Rich. And I'm your host, Frank Lavallo. Until next time, I hope you find yourself in a novel conversation. Hi, I'm Emma. And I'm Joe. And, and we're, we're the Professional, the professional book, book Nerds. Two Mondays a month, we interview authors and talk about their upcoming books, what drives them, and their go-to order at the cafe. On Thursdays, we share recommendations and dive into topics readers face, like how do I actually read the books on my to-be-read list? You can find the Professional Book Nerds podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.
Want to learn more about us? Our website is professionalbooknerds.com, and you can find us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at ProBookNerds. We hope you'll come and listen, and as always, happy happy reading. reading! This podcast was produced with the support of the Ohio Motion Picture Tax Credit and in partnership with the Ohio Development Services Agency.